Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. My guest this week is Zach Narani, partner at Foundation Capital. Zach, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. Cool. So we're going to be talking a little bit about neobanks. Before we get there, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself and where you're coming from? Yeah, sure. Um, Yes. As you mentioned, I'm a partner here at Foundation Capital. Uh, We're a 30-year-old, $6 billion under management uh, venture firm. Uh, we're earliest investors in companies like Netflix, Sunrun, Rappi, Solana. You know, my background, uh, 100% of what I do is uh, fintech investing. Uh, I spent early my whole career in financial services, uh, the first decade of which I spent at Capital One. And there we were really um, building and buying our way into new business lines, diversifying beyond being a credit card issuer principally. And somewhere along the lines, uh, I, I, I realized uh, doing this from a, a small company perspective, you know, building building new products and financial services was a lot more fun and, and frankly, a lot more lucrative. And so I've been sure. doing that. I've been living in this uh, this fintech land uh, of, uh, since before the mortgage crisis, actually, so it going, goes way back. Uh, and these days, so um, I'm an investor in companies like uh, One Finance, which actually just sold to Hazel slash Walmart, uh, Current. Uh, Addy, uh, buy now, pay later business down in Columbia, uh, Highline, uh, the list goes goes on and on. No, it's really cool. And the amount of experience that you're bringing to the equation is obviously pretty substantial here. Um, and that's why I think it's great to get your thoughts. Um, so let's talk about, you know, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about neobanks here. Before we get too far, I'm curious how you define that having been in the fintech industry for so long. Are they necessarily digital only or just digital first, or does it have more to do with when they were created? How, how do you define the word neobank? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I accept the the colloquial meaning, uh, which is, you know, I think people intend, um, you know, digital first and really even more so mobile first. Uh, and I think importantly, um, uh, DDA first. So, so very, very strictly checking account uh, oriented that might, you might add products over time, but that sort of origin is there. Um, you know, I think more broadly, you know, I, I, I'm remiss not to say sort of I struggle with with startup no- nomenclature like this. Um, startups, uh, these organisms, they, they evolve uh, so quickly. Um, terms like neobank, um, you know, at first they seem grandiose, uh, you know, just kind of way beyond kind of what the businesses actually are. And then before you know it, uh, they end up feeling overly narrow and constricting. Um, and so it's sort of, uh, you know, I always try to sort of uh, uh, not get to get too stuck on the labels. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on there. That pattern is something I've definitely noticed as well. You know, at first it's promising the moon and then later on you're like, wait a minute, well, that doesn't quite describe me actually. We're a little bit different. So we certainly see that on the Finnovate stage with some regularity. No, 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 I'm not buy now, pay later or whatever the case may be. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a fair point. Um, so, you know, obviously at a really high level, and you've been watching this space, the past 10 years, we've seen two trends kind of moving in opposite directions. There have been a lot of bank closures, consolidations, a lot of branch closures. At the same time, you know, it seems like neobanks are popping up more and more frequently. How can you explain how both of those situations can be true at the same time? Yeah, yeah. I can see how, you know, the contrast seems really odd. Um, you know, the first piece here, the closures, the m a uh, that's just what happens in mature industries, uh, which banking absolutely is. Um, uh, very unlike tech, uh, uh, where you see, you know, uh, the the, very, the largest of companies in the world still growing 20, 30 um, percent. Banking, uh, you know, over the cycle, this grows at some factor of, of GDP growth. Um, and so the the, the closures, um, you know, there are certainly some, you know, smaller smaller institutions going into business, but more than anything else, the, the branch closures here. That's that's uh, larger institutions, you know, repositioning their branch footprints uh, to account for, you know, shifting population patterns. You know, and these branches are in many cases, uh, um, you know, 30, 30, 60, 60 years old. Um, the M and A uh, is, you know, as you say, uh, it's really about consolidation. Um, that there are scale benefits in all kinds of ways in banking. Um, that is to say that uh, 
the bigger you are, the more likely you are to find competitive advantage. And because it's a, this is a really mature, highly competitive, and, and really realistically like commoditized industry, the most efficient growth path uh, to all these, you know, really pretty long in the tooth players is acquisitions of businesses that look exactly like theirs. And so we see lots and lots of consolidation and, and have been, you know, we, we, this is a 30 year old trend. And I think, I think we've got another 30, another 30 years left of it. Now on the, on the neobank side, you know, what explains the, the up, you know, the, the, the growth of, 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 of these animals? Um, well, they found an entirely different path of efficient growth. And I characterize that as mobile first, uh, lower or, or different cost structure. You know, in, in some ways it's much lower with, without the branches, but in other ways that a lot of that spend really just is translates to ads. Um, and with a different revenue model uh, using, you know, kind of leveraging a, a Durban, Durban exemption to sort of have more lucrative uh, debit interchange. And while it's not impossible for banks to replicate that or many banks that are sort of below that Durban threshold, um, the basis of competition here. Um, the way that the neobanks succeed, this really, this really the same way, uh, for instance, an e-commerce provider would succeed in terms of, um, you know, uh, efficiently employing, uh, deploying ad dollars and funnel and digital funnel conversion. Uh, and, you know, for a traditional bank, uh, that's just not something they're built to succeed at. Now, um, because this neobank growth path is so efficient and the banking industry, you know, overall is so massive, there's there's really been no end in sight uh, to the amount of VC dollars and and growth capital willing to fund it, and so, you know, hence you know uh, we've seen the, this massive proliferation over the last uh, last half decade or so. No, that's a really interesting point there about the capital side of it because there is so much VC money going into the neobank space. Obviously, the traditional financial institutions don't have access to that kind of capital, and they also don't have the luxury of saying, you know, we're going to wait five years to become profitable. Um, you know, you, you don't have that ability to kind of grow and really focus on the growth side and scale up in that same way. So how big of a role do you think that actually plays in kind of the, the differences between the two sides of the coin at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think uh, quite a bit, right? Like uh, an ability to sort of pitch investors and sort of say, uh, I, "I'm not. I have no intention of making money for almost the next decade, um, and yet I want you to, you know, uh, uh, value my business in a way that enables me to own, continue to own the vast majority of it." Um, that's really unfair advantage, uh, you know, kind of relative to a more traditional, you know, in any mature industry, you know, there's, you know, you're going to be getting asked really hard questions about ROEs. Um, and how quickly you can start generating generating those ROEs, um, and and so you know the you know the VC capital is you know uh, uh, for the for the moment you know really available to the the, the neobank side, and that kind of like we have we have a lot of growth ambition, and we but but profitability is is um, you know kind of a, a, a longer term um, you know kind of goal. Where where on the you know the bank side, obviously it's sort of like. Uh, very little tolerance uh, for that for that kind of narrative, and so um, y- yeah, it's a it's a different story entirely. Yeah, and then I think the other side of it too is obviously the the customer side of it. What do you think neobanks are able to offer to customers that more traditional FIs maybe either aren't able or, or struggle to offer? Yeah, so I think you know they're um, they're obviously the marketable features which the banks are catching up to as we as we speak. You know stuff like a, a very slick uh, mobile app experience, um, no maintenance or penalty fees uh, for for account usage, uh, and then stuff like advances on direct deposit. Uh, and I and I think those have, have been a, played a big role, um, you know, thus far in this in this uh, evolution of neobanks. But underlying that, I'd argue that it's a lot more about mobile acquisition with uh, modern consumer brands. Um, you know, I'll use maybe use myself as an example. Um, as someone who spent the vast majority of my adult life uh, with a smartphone, I have, and because of that, I, I have a base expectation that uh, the products that I'm going to uh, that I'm that I'm looking for, I'll find them on Instagram. That I can sign up, that I can apply, buy that product in real time on my phone, um, and. And that principally uh, is what I'd argue neobanks are succeeding at uh, the most and is what and is what someone like a Bank of America is failing to keep up with. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, too, because clearly, you know, they're 
the ways that people are searching for these products, the way that um, they're kind of absorbing marketing is, is obviously shifted quite a bit. And the uh, corp companies that are able to speak that language really fluently clearly have an advantage. Let's broaden out a little bit because I think you know we've been kind of focused on neobank specifically, but how is this neobank surge affecting other aspects of the banking and finance ecosystems? I mean, really, what's what's the ripple effect here? And we can kind of approach it from um, both kind of the industry side and then the consumer side if it's easier to break it down that way. Yeah, yeah, no, interesting question. So, you know, on the industry side, I think the effects thus far are relatively marginal, uh, you know, stuff like merchants, um, hotels, let's say, can now uh, discriminate uh, acceptance by issuer. Uh, so, so to say, I, I'm not going to accept um, uh, 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 cash app debit cards, you know, as a means of reserving a hotel room, because I know uh, chargebacks are going to be drastically higher than they would be for, let's say, a Bank of America debit card, uh, because, they have those two, you know, those two uh, companies have very different customer profiles. Um, other opportunities, you know, for let's say more industrious banks to to partner with the neo banks um, in various ways to benefit from their their kind of massive acquisition engine. So maybe on maybe that means sponsor bank uh, kind of business, or or really on the asset generation side, um, getting access to all those customers. On the customer side, the impacts are are much bigger. You know, the first and foremost, you've got a hell of a lot of savings on on penalty fees. You know, this is obviously like a you know uh, twenty to forty billion dollars worth of worth of cost that um, you know gets taxed on the American consumer for you know kind of uh, overdrafting your bank bank account um, that that has been that has been removed uh, for for a neo bank user. By that same token, um, you know, overdrafts have a um, you know, while pretty reprehensibly priced, um, are a huge source of short-term credit uh, for uh, for a lot of consumers. And so, you know, I think uh, you know one ripple effect that we'll see is, uh, you know, that demand will get served elsewhere. Um, you know, new forms of payday lenders in what, some some shape or form. Now, l- longer term, you know, for consumers, I think this gets really interesting. Um, you know, I, I, you know, no one knows for sure, but I think this is really a story about uh, new kinds of bundling. You know, maybe coming back to where we started about the nomenclature and, and kind of the challenges with it. For example, should a neo bank help you find an auto loan? Uh, I think that you know, an easy answer is like, of course. You know, that's that's sure. a core business of you know, that's a that's a core business of Bank of America as well. Um, but why can't that neobank also be the tool that helps you find the right car in the first place to buy? Um, there's no natural limit here, given uh, you know, given that the DNA of a company like Current, let's say, it, this is a software company. This isn't this isn't a bank. Um, and and considering the incredible engagement, the richness of data that a primary checking account relationship holds, you know, I think. I think we could all end up being quite surprised by the degree of sprawl and, and bundling we end up we end up seeing here with these you know, these software companies that you know are are sort of in the business of providing financial services. No, that bundling one is a really interesting one. Unfortunately, we don't have time to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper today, but that's a really uh, good one for anybody to kind of follow up on and just even sort of watch this space, as they say. Um, but let's let's end by kind of zooming out even further because. You know, this is obviously a transition point. We're in a moment where things are shifting and shifting pretty quickly. Broadly speaking, where does this end? Is there you know, a stasis point or something like that that's visible on the horizon where we think, okay, now we'll have a new system in place? Yeah, well, I think you know the, the, the first point here that I, uh, I, I get excited about is that this is, there, there isn't going to be an end to this. This is going to go on for, for decades um, you know the the fundamental shift of service delivery model from uh, hyper local, you know, brick and mortar to to digital. Um, you know, this is going to going to take a really long time. You know, and there will be lots of opportunity resulting. Um, but I think let's to get real specific. You know, uh, it's really interesting to think about what happens to. I've been picking on Bank of America a lot, so let's we'll, we'll keep doing that. Um, you know, what happens to them over the next uh, couple of decades, particularly let's say their their consumer business. Um, and consumer consumer banking business, you know, right now, I'd imagine they aren't terribly worried about neo banks. Um, they make the vast majority of their money off of older and richer customers. Neo banks haven't really touched that segment of the population yet, uh, and that's because 
very few 50 year olds with complex financial lives are really open to switching checking accounts. And so the tried and true way that uh, that you get that Bank of America got all these, you know, kind of affluent 50 year old banking customers, it's it's that they signed them up when they were 25 and they they grew with them. They they retained them and they uh, and, and enabled the, those those individuals to you know, sort of, sort of grow into, um, you know, kind of very profitable customers for them. And so. What do we knew, know? What do we know to be true today uh, about uh, uh, about kind of market share shifts? It's that uh, the share Bank of America's share of twenty five year old uh, primary checking customers um, was probably let, let's assume it to be the case it was you know exactly analogous to their overall kind of deposit share of um, of, of the U S market eleven percent eleven twelve percent let's say five years ago today because of uh, you know, Chime, Current, uh, Cash App, Vero, uh, and the other, you know, uh, uh, other other host of players, that's probably more like 5% and falling precipitously. Uh, and, and so really what we have is an effect here of, you know, as the, the you know, there will be, there will be blood, you know, line about, about milkshakes, uh, you know, this uh, drink your milkshake. That's, that's what's happening here. Um, you know, uh, uh, 20 years from now, the Bank of America's share of that 50 year old uh, class of customers where they make all their money, well, that's gonna have collapsed. Um, and so I think this will be a, a fascinating phenomenon to, to watch and largely, you know, it's this kind of thing where it's sort of already happened. It's just uh, uh, not yet uh, manifested in, in, in the PL. Yeah, no, the, the rock has been thrown, but the ripples are still radiating outward, basically. It's going to be, as you say, fascinating to watch this space because so much of how financial services is going to in- engage with itself over the next 20 to 30 years is being decided right now. And there are clearly forward-thinking financial institutions who are well aware of this, who are aggressively targeting you know, this younger market, trying to shore up their futures. And there's clearly also banks and financial institutions on the other side for whom that's not the case, for whom they are just looking at this and thinking, you know, I can run out the clock. I don't have to worry about this. But in 20 years, it won't be my problem. It'll be somebody else's problem. And I think the difference between the two groups is going to get starker and starker. Um, and it may follow in many cases, you know, the same kind of trajectory as, you know, the companies who 10 years ago uh, started looking at financial technology. Some of them really jumped in. Some banks said, yes, this is the future. We need to engage here. And a lot of them said, you know, there's nothing here that we need to worry about. Um, we've kind of seen how that's gone. And I think you're right. We'll see something similar in this other area as well. So um, I've been talking with Zach Narani, partner of Foundation Capital. Zach, thanks again for taking the time to chat with me. It's been a really fascinating conversation. And there's quite a bit for us all to keep an eye on over the next couple of years. Thanks a ton, Greg. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>